Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Atlanta History Center. My name is Claire Haley. My role here is Vice President for Special Projects, and I'm so thrilled that you are all able to join us for tonight's Livingston Lecture featuring authors Elizabeth B. White and Joanna Sliwa. They are here discussing their powerful new book, The Counterfeit Countess, the Jewish woman who rescued thousands of Poles during the Holocaust. On behalf of Atlanta History Center, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation for the Livingston Foundation for making this evening and many others possible. The counterfeit countess tells an incredible true story of Dr. Josephine Yanina Melberg, who placed herself in great personal peril during the Holocaust by disguising herself and saving thousands of lives in extraordinary ways. I highly encourage you to leave here tonight with a copy of this book. I promise you're going to want it. You're going to want to read it. Um, They're for sale out in the lobby. They are 25% off tonight only. Um, so please help us support this series and the authors that we host uh, by purchasing a copy of the book. Uh, both authors will also be autographing the book in the lobby following the event. Uh, so we have two distinguished historians tonight joining us who teamed up for this book. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Elizabeth Barry White. She is recently retired from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, where she served as historian and as research director for the Center of Prevention of Genocide. Before that, um, she had a career at the U.S. Department of Justice working on investigations and prosecutions of Nazi criminals and other human rights violators. She is joined uh, by her co-author, Dr. Joanna Sliwa, who is a historian at the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, the Claims Conference in New York, where she also administers academic programs. Uh, she has also taught um, on the Holocaust and Jewish history at the collegiate level, and she is, this is her second book. Her other book is called Jewish Childhood in Krakow. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming tonight's authors, Elizabeth B. White and Joanna Sliwa. on. There we go. How's that? Better? Hello. <laughs> so we're very grateful to the Atlanta History Center and, um, and uh, the Livingston Foundation for giving us this opportunity tonight. We're so excited to talk to you about the remarkable life of Yanina Mailberg, an amazing heroine no one has ever heard of. So I first learned about her in 1989 when I gave an academic conference paper on Maidanic concentration camp, which was located in German-occupied Lublin, Poland during World War II. After the panel, a historian I didn't know handed me a carbon copy manuscript. He said it was the memoir of a Janina Mailberg who helped Maidanic prisoners by posing as a Polish Christian, Christian aristocrat. She had died in Chicago in 1969, and efforts to publish her memoir had failed. So this historian was going to donate it to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, but he really wanted me to take this copy because I was working on my donut, so he hoped that I would be able to make the memoir story known. Well, as I read that story, my jaw dropped and continued dropping. Yanina Mailberg, claimed that she survived the Holocaust in Poland under the false identity of the Countess Sukodolska. She used this aristocratic identity to become an official of a Polish relief organization that the Germans allowed to operate in Lublin, but only to aid non-Jewish Poles. Thanks to her flawless German, she was actually assigned to negotiate with Nazi and SS officials in Lublin for measures to aid Poles. She was extraordinarily persistent in her negotiations. It seemed that she never took no as a final answer. And when she did finally get to ask yes, she considered it an invitation to ask for even more. So I want to show you right now. This is a map of the city of Lublin during World War II under German occupation. And on the edge of it, you can see the uh, 
concentration camp that the SS built, and it was known by the locals as Maidana. So at this camp, Yanina Mailberg, as the countess, continually pressed the SS to allow her organization to bring in ever larger quantities of ever more supplies for thousands of prisoners. She even got permission to deliver decorated Christmas trees and Easter eggs. Nothing like this happened at any other concentration camp. She made most of these deliveries herself. And she actually persuaded the SS to let her bring them inside the camp, all the way up to the gate of each one of these fields or prisoner compounds. There, she was able to interact furtively with the prisoners who were unloading the deliveries. And so she used those deliveries as cover to smuggle messages and supplies to members of the resistance imprisoned in Maidana. Because in addition to pol posing as a Polish official, she was also an officer in the Home Army, the Army of the Polish Resistance. Now, Lublin was the headquarters of the largest murder operation of the Holocaust, Operation Reinhardt. The SS gassed most of its 1.7 million Jewish victims in the killing centers of Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. But at least 63,000 were murdered in Majdanek's gas chambers and shooting pits. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I did that. We got it. Yes. OK. So this is an aerial photo of Majdanek. Here you can see the prisoner compound that was field one in the previous slide. And here is a U-shaped building. This is where the gas chambers were housed. Every time Yanina Mailberg brought her deliveries into Majdanek, she passed that building. And according to her memoir, she knew what was happening to Jews there. So this claim that she, as a Jewish woman, had dared to enter this den of mass murder almost daily and to smuggle messages and supplies to the resistance under the noses of the SS seemed to me almost too fantastic to be true. I couldn't use the memoir without first verifying it. And I didn't have any way to do that at the time, particularly since I don't know Polish. So I figured that a historian with the right skills would find it in the Holocaust Museum archives and do what was necessary to bring it to life. But years and decades passed, that didn't happen. And I never forgot this amazing story, because if it was true, it needed to be told. And then I wondered, was that my responsibility? So in 2017, I really started digging into who this Yanina Mailberg was. All I had to go on to begin with was information that was provided by her husband, Henry Mailberg, a philosopher. After Yanina died, uh, he translated her memoir from Polish into English, and he added a preface. You can see the first page of it here. Based on that, I assumed that Yanina was born Yanina Spinner in 1915. This information was confirmed by her immigration records to the US, which I also obtained. But then I came across two photos of Henry with his fellow philosophy students in 1925. A woman appears in each of these, identified in one as Josepha Mailberg, and in the other as Pepe Spinner. This clearly had to be Yanina Mailberg. She clearly also isn't 10 years old, which she would have been if she'd been born in 1915. Uh, with the help of three Polish scholars, I was able to determine that she was actually born Pepe Spinner in 1905. And finally, I found a reference in a footnote to a 1975 book review that made me think that Janina probably was Countess Sukodolska. That's when I reached out to Joanna, whom I only knew by reputation as an expert on the Holocaust in Poland. Well, as soon as she read Yanina's memoir, she agreed to partner with me in investigating Yanina's life. And very quickly, she found definitive proof that Yanina was Countess Sukodolska. And what's more, we found that she achieved far more remarkable things than she even claimed in her memoir. So our book is a product of detective work. 
to trace the history of a woman whose survival depended on covering her tracks. She was living under a false identity. The first piece of evidence confirming that Janina Suhodolska was in fact Janina Melberg came from an archive in New York. The Yivo Institute for Jewish Research holds a file on Henry Melberg in the records of Hayas. Now some of you may know that Hayas is short for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, a Jewish organization established in the 19th century to help Jewish immigrants in the US. But after World War II, Hayas helped Jewish Holocaust survivors emigrate from Poland, from Europe. The Hayas files are not open to researchers but we managed to persuade the archivist about the importance of the story. And that is how we gained access to this important resource. The file contains Henry's correspondence with various Jewish organizations in 1949. Henry wrote those letters from Canada where he managed to obtain an academic fellowship. He was begging to help get his wife, Pepi Melberg, out of communist Poland. But there was a catch. She was living in Poland under the alias of Janina Suchodolska. And on this photograph, you see here, this is an excerpt from one of the letters that Henry wrote to, um, to, to the Jewish organizations. Our research continued. And the wartime archival records revealed that Janina's accomplishments were even more astonishing than what she claimed in her memoir. For example, here you see a part of a report that Janina filed as Countess Suchodolska about her efforts in summer 1943 to try to obtain the release of thousands of Polish peasants from the Majdanek camp. These Polish peasants, these, Polish, uh, these Poles were peasants who were seized from their homes and their villages in these brutal ethnic cleansing campaigns that were organized by the Germans. The SS quickly sent off those who were considered able-bodied to perform forced labor, and the rest, children and those who were deemed unable to work, older people, sick people, women, in Majdanek. These, these Polish peasants were rapidly dying from horrific conditions in the camp, and Janina managed to win an agreement with the SS to release over 3,000 of those peasants. But in the end, only a little over 2,000 were released from Majdanek, and nearly 200 of them mainly children, died within the first two days. And Janina makes no mention of this in her memoir. One reason for that, we believe, is that she did not view it as a success because she did not manage to save all 3,600 Polish peasants. Based on the wartime documents, uh, we were able to establish that Janina negotiated the release from captivity of 9,700 Poles. But of course, it's impossible to estimate how many more survived because of Janina's relief and resistance efforts. So we're talking about Janina's efforts during the war in Majdanek and so on, but who was this Countess Janina Suchodolska before she assumed the false identity of a Polish aristocrat. Janina grew up in a small town, and you have it marked right here, and these are the current borders, um, but it was right here. Uh, this was in the multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual borderlands in what today is Ukraine. The area used to be part of Poland between the two world wars. Janina's father was a wealthy landowner who mingled with the Polish nobility. And this kind of privileged upbringing allowed Janina to absorb the languages, the customs, and the mannerisms 
of the upper classes. And in this photograph, you see an early photograph of Yanina. Yanina was also very gifted in math. In the 1920s, she obtained a master's degree in math, where she, and she studied under two of Europe's leading mathematicians at the time. And she did that at the prestigious university in Lviv, today Lviv, Ukraine. But Yanina found it almost impossible as a woman to get a PhD in math. So she studied instead under a charismatic professor who welcomed mathematicians and philosophers and Jews uh, among his students. And on this photograph, you see, uh, you see Yanina right here, and you see the professor Kazimierz Twardowski. Yanina obtained a PhD at the age of 22. Afterwards, she spent a year at the Sorbonne in Paris. And when she returned to Poland, she changed her first name to the more sophisticated sounding Józefa. And I just want to point out on this slide right here that Yanina's uh, dissertation defense, the fact that she obtained a PhD, was recorded in the Jewish newspaper in Lviv, in Chvila, which is translated as a moment. And here you have Spinner Pepe from Zhuravno. That was her hometown. So now we have uh, Pepe who changed her name to Yusefa. Uh, she and Henry m married in 1933. And, uh, and then they had teaching positions in Lvov. This was their beloved city. They were very active in the intellectual circles. Yanina's language skills, her ability to operate in a non-Jewish environment, her creativity, her intelligence, all that later helped her perform her false identity, survive, and more than that, fool the German authorities. It was by chance that Yanina and Henry fled from Lvov to Lublin. And before I go any further, I just want to point out this photograph of Yanina, another very early photograph, probably when she changed her name to, uh, to, to, to Yusefa. So in December 1941, a family friend, Count Andrei Skrzynski, whom you see here on this photograph, this is a post-war photograph, obviously, you see here getting married to his fourth wife, and you see him, him here as well, also a postcard photograph. So in December 1941, Count Andrzej Skrzynski arrives in Lwów with a mission to save the Melbergs. Once they arrived in Lublin, Skrzynski gave the Melbergs the false identities of Countess Janina and Count Piotr Suchodolski. Clearly, Skrzynski was the Melberg's rescuer, but he also enabled Janina to engage in her rescue, relief, and resistance efforts. After the war, Janina decided that it was still too dangerous to reveal her true identity, especially in, in communist Poland. And so, as Dr. Janina Suchodolska, social worker, she became a leader in Poland's new social welfare organization. Henry, on the other hand, returned to his pre-war identity and he resumed his academic career. The photos that you see here show a rare occasion when Henry, Janina, and Henry's two surviving brothers and their wives were able to reunite in post-war Poland. But soon, rising anti-Semitic violence convinced all of them that they have to leave Poland. In her new role, uh, Janina traveled around Poland where she witnessed the miserable conditions of the Polish population. And as part of her United Nations Fellowship, she came to the United States and traveled around the country to learn about new approaches to child welfare. On this slide here, you see clippings 
from newspapers and photographs of Yanina. So local newspapers documented Yanina's visits. While in the United States, Yanina made contacts that helped Henry leave Poland for Canada in 1949. Yanina finally also managed to, to leave Poland by escaping in 1950. She joined Henry in Canada as Dr. Josephine Yanina Spinner Melberg, mathematician. <laughs> the Melbergs lived in Canada for six years, and without family members or children of their own, they forged substitute families with their pre-war friends who also settled in Canada. And on these photographs, you see the, this is the uh, Gisela Klinghofer and Joseph Klinghofer, whom they knew from their time in Lvov. In 1956, Janina and Henry emigrated to Chicago. And it was there that each of them pursued their academic paths. Henry as professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago, and Janina as professor of mathematics at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Now, this was a really exceptional position for her as a woman and an immigrant in a largely male-dominated field. No one except her closest friends, like the Klinghoffers, who had been Holocaust survivors, no one knew that about the remarkable story that Janina recorded on paper. So our original plan, once we verified the memoir, was to publish it along with some text explaining its references and the historical context of its events. But the memoir only covers the wartime years and only certain aspects of Yanina's life as the countess. So when we realized that the memoir doesn't even do justice to what she did during the war and that her life before and after the war was pretty remarkable too, we realized we needed to write her biography. But of course, we had this wonderful source, her memoir, which lets us tell the story largely from her perspective incorporating her observations, experiences, and the conversations that she recounted. There are many vivid, riveting scenes in the memoir, such as when Yanina saved Henry from a mass shooting, and also her two narrow escapes from arrest by the Gestapo. I'd like to read a passage from the book that is based on Yanina's account of her and Henry's flight from Wolf to Lublin with Count Shkinsky. Can you read the slide again? Okay. There we go. This was a very dangerous journey because they had to travel without any identity papers or the armbands marking them as Jews, both of which were capital offenses. After three days and three nights, they arrived at Lublin, hoping to get out of the station quickly without encountering any police checks. The men went to retrieve the baggage while Yanina sought a cab. She found one easily, then waited with increasing anxiety, straining for a sight of Henry and the Count, while the cab driver complained about losing other fares. Finally, nearly an hour later, she saw Count Shkinsky approach. He was alone. You and I are going home now, he said, taking her arm. Henry was detained by some German police for something, and he'll come after us. Yanina broke away from him and ran back into the station. There, she saw Henry being berated by a German official who was shouting that taking any baggage out of Galicia was strictly prohibited. Henry looked pale. At any moment, the official would demand to see his papers. Yanina sprang into action. What do you want of my husband, she demanded in German as she stepped in front of Henry and fixed the official with a haughty look. Startled by her peremptory tone and apparent lack of fear, the official lost his swagger and replied in a lower voice, he has broken a strict regulation on baggage. He could do no such thing, Yanina retorted, because when we left Wolf, there was no such regulation. The official backed down and said lamely, anyway, he has to pay a fine. If they agreed to the fine, Yanina realized, they would have to show papers so it could be recorded. 
We are not going to pay any fine, she declared firmly, because there was no regulation about this, and if you will put through a call to Wolf, you will hear it for yourself. Now, flustered and fuming, the official ordered them to get out, and don't let me catch you another time. Careful not to give away their relief, Yanina and Henry sauntered out of the station with their two bags. Never did a harshly bellowed order sound so sweet, Yanina thought. Decades later, she would reflect on the lesson she learned in this encounter and that she would use again and again to save lives in the years that followed it. What do you do with your fear and trembling in a confrontation with a swaggering bully? You confine it to the small prison of the heart, letting none seep into the muscles of the eyes, hands, or legs. You quake within and show calm authority without. You pull off a hoax. You must not toady to them. You must not let them sniff blood. Composure and coolness toward them implied the backing of power. And in the face of power, they might very well shrink. Three days earlier, Pepe Mailbird had departed Wolf for Lublin. Countess Yanina Sukodolska arrived in her place. We found Yanina's memoir inspiring not only because of the actions that it reports, <laughs> amazing as they are, but also because of what it reveals about her character and motivations. She was not fearless, as this passage I just read shows, but she was deeply compassionate and empathetic, and that's what drove her passion for saving lives. Henry wrote in his preface that Yanina's actions were guided by a simple mathematical principle. One life has a lesser value than multiple lives, and her own life, if she survived without seeking to save others, would have no value. Henry also wrote that Yanina's memoir was her testimony. It testifies not just to what she did and witnessed, but also to the lessons that she drew about human nature from observing it within the midst of the horrors of occupied Poland. She wrote very movingly of the terrible choices that people were forced to make, as in this passage. What would a mother do in the face of the impossible choices put to her there was one who, with her daughter, hid in the wardrobes of her apartment during a raid. They found her daughter, but not her. The child sobbed and screamed for her mother to save her. The mother kept silent and survived. I know this from the mother herself, who, sobbing out her story, wished herself dead instead of condemned to live with this memory. Another mother, mother hid with her son in a bunker. Her son ventured out at the wrong time. He was seized and shot right there. The mother heard and remained silent. A young Jewish woman was offered the privilege of choosing whether her mother or her husband would be executed the next day. A father was offered his life on condition he stand and watch his son being hanged and smiled all the while. If the smile left his face, he would be hanged too. He kept smiling. And who is to judge the impulse to survive? Now, years later, I try not to judge, but simply to report, since we who continue as members of the human race are obliged to know its capacities, however grim and unbearable the knowledge may be. But knowledge is not the same as enduring, and I am not sure that knowledge alone gives us the right to judge. The mystery is too great how we respond to unbearable demands. Because while physical and psychic tortures broke many, some reacted with what can only, one can only call moral grandeur. I know some and heard of many others who helped their fellow sufferers at the cost of their own lives, who confessed to others' crimes, who willingly chose death over a degrading life. So the murder of goodness was not thorough, and this fact too, must be reported. Yanina wrote about people who were her enemies, who she knew were involved in terrible crimes, and yet who took risks to help and even save her. And she was well aware that many of those who risked their lives alongside her, whom she rescued, who lit candles and said prayers for the safety of Countess Sukodolska, would have despised her, maybe done worse, if they had known that she was a Jew. 
Her specialty as a mathematician was probability, and she was co continually weighing the risks and chances for success of her actions. She came to see that she could not predict whether someone would help or harm her based just on that person's ethnicity, religion, or ideology. And she came to understand that none of us is completely defined by either the worst or the best that we do. And so she decided for herself not to judge others, but to approach each person as a fellow member of what she called the vast suffering human family. And if they were suffering, then she considered it her human duty to relieve their suffering. Yanina's memoir is really an invaluable testimony of one woman's survival during the Holocaust. And from it, we learn about how her rescue was arranged and how she, in turn, arranged the rescue of others. We learn about her motivations to endanger her life even more to help those whom she could, non-Jewish Poles. And only then, she reasoned, did her life and survival have a purpose. Yanina witnessed the beginning and the end of the largest mass murder operation of the Holocaust. But her memoir is also a testimony about the suffering and persecution of non-Jewish Polish non-Jewish Poles, and I can't change the- oh, It did go up. It didn't go, okay. And right there it is. Mm -hmm. So her, her, um, her memoir is also a testimony about the persecution of non-Jewish Poles under German occupation. The Nazis viewed ethnic Poles as subhuman enemies, and they planned to eliminate most of them after the end of the war. The Germans pursued their anti-Polish uh, policy with brutality and determination. They destroyed and looted Polish national and cultural treasures. They shot members of the Polish intelligentsia. They put millions of Poles to forced labor. And they conducted bloody ethnic cleansing and reprisal campaigns. And on these photographs here, you see these are German photographs documenting what I just said. Here is a Polish monument being toppled in Kraków. This is a convoy of, um, of Poles being driven to, to a mass shooting action. And this photograph is from the expulsion of entire Polish families from the Zamość area near Lublin. Janina's memoir also pays tribute to the Poles who worked with her to resist the German occupiers and to help each other survive. And many of those Poles, even most, were women. Our book recounts the stories of some of these women who also deserve to be recognized as heroes of the Polish resistance. On this slide here, you see photographs of the women we write about in our book and about the feats that they engaged in. Barry and I are professional Holocaust historians. And over the course of our respective work, sorry, OK, this is not changing. Um, we read numerous testimonies, memoirs, and diaries. We listened to many oral histories. And neither of us has ever encountered a story such as that of Yanina's. Yanina's story is unique in that she was a Jew trying to survive under a false identity. And still, she managed to rescue thousands of non-Jewish Poles and she negotiated with top Nazis to enlarge the scope and scale of relief to non-Jews. On this slide here, you see, well, the photographs that we could find of, some of, the, of the top uh, uh, of German officials with whom she negotiated, including the manager of Operation Reinhardt, the largest mass murder operation of the, of the Holocaust, 
And here you see just the names of some other German officials. But the story of every Holocaust victim is unique. Their stories reveal the terror, the horror, the almost unimaginable suffering that Jews endured. But these stories are also about family, faith, resistance, and resilience. And we need these stories to remind us of our common humanity with the six million and to show us the danger that we all face when we fail to confront hate and protect the dignity of every human. It has taken 80 years for Yanina's story to be told. How many other stories of Holocaust victims and survivors await to be told? Their stories deserve to be told, and the world needs their stories. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have some time for your questions. So if you raise your hand, I will come to you with the microphone so that our authors can question tonight. Yes, thank you. That was so interesting. I wondered if she is in the Avenue of the Righteous, which is an area at Yad Vashem that is dedicated to non-Jews who helped to save Jews during the Holocaust. And since she was posing as someone not Jewish, is she there? Uh, no. Um so her story, insofar as it was known about Countess Sukodolska, the people she saved were Poles, not Jews. So, and she wouldn't qualify now that her story is being told because she was a Jew and she saved Poles, not Jews. <laughs> but her rescuer, Count Andrzej Skrzynski, yeah. is not recognized by Yad Vashem either. And so our goal yeah. is that this story, this book, will serve as evidence of his courageous act where he risked his life to save the Melbergs, and we hope that he will be recognized as a righteous. Hi, I read the book, and it's got such a rich bibliography, and you also face challenges yourself researching once COVID hit, and I thought maybe you could ex explain that and where you found so many of these sources, because so many are in Polish. I don't know where they are uh, and exactly what they are, but could you talk a little bit about that, how you got together, faced your challenges during the pandemic, and found most of the material? That is such a fantastic question, because we began working together in 2018, and in summer 2018, I made a trip to Poland, to Lublin, to look at some of the files of the Maine Welfare Council. That was the organization, the relief organization for which Janina worked. And we were planning to return to Poland to do some more research at that particular archive, but also in Majdanek. We wanted to see the sites in Lublin that were connected to Janina's story. We even planned to travel to Ukraine to do our research in Lviv, in the, in the archives there, and to travel to some of the places that were connected to Yanina's life. Well, as we all know, that was made impossible because of the Russian war on Ukraine, so we could not go there. And during the pandemic, that also restricted our abilities to do research in person. And I, we always stress how much we benefited from colleagues, from librarians, from archivists around the world who shared with us documents so that we could continue with our research. In terms of the documentation, we had to make every effort to corroborate Yanina's story, what she wrote in her memoir, and that was detective work in, 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 in itself. Um, we found evidence for much of, what she, much of what she wrote, including details about her receiving recognition for her work in the Maine Welfare Council. And there it was in a file in a Polish archive, in a folder, uh, a, a kind of a, a letter stating, you know, a, a, a thank you for your, uh, for your service. So we went even to that, um, that extent of, of detail. 
But just like um, just another note on the on the research is that research for this book involved historical research, traditional in archives, but also genealogical research, which meant we wanted to find out as much as possible about Yonina, about her family, about her background. So we looked into various genealogical databases. We looked into newspapers, like the clipping that I showed you, right, of the um, pre-war Jewish newspaper in, in Lviv. We even accessed Yanina's dissertation. So these are the type, just examples of the documents that we were able to find. Yeah, and we were, uh, benefited from uh, redoubled efforts by many archives and institutions to digitize their sources and make them available online. Uh, we also benefited from Facebook. <laughs> which we used, you know, when we, when we found traces of people, this, this person might have been related, you know, we could use Facebook to get in touch with them. So uh, a lot of different uh, um, sources. There were, um, the Maidanic Museum has made a lot of resources available. They collected lots of statements of former prisoners, um, which were very, very helpful for uh, some of them remembered Yanina, but they were also very helpful when it came to writing the narrative of the book, of trying to figure out when things happened. Yanina's memoir is not chronological. It starts with the first day of World War II, ends when the Soviets take Lublin in 1944. But then it's just kind of, here's what I did at Majdanek. Here's how, what we did to save Volinian refugees. Uh, and, as, you know, and we know that it didn't cover everything that she did. Uh, so, and she rarely said when anything happened, <laughs> which is very frustrating. So, you know, using all these variety of sources of the, the wartime documentation, the, the memories, the, the uh, memoirs and statements and testimonies of people she worked with and the former Maidanic prisoners, often they contradicted each other too and didn't say exactly when things happened, but trying to triangulate all of these things and to create a timeline that would let us tell this story as a, as a narrative, as a nonfiction narrative, because, because we really wanted it to be accessible to a general readership. We did not want this to be an academic study, although we think there's a lot in here. And in fact, we know that that is of interest to academics. Other questions? I wondered, because, oh, yes. I may have missed it, but were you, have you tried to, can you penetrate any German research on this? I mean, they kept such detailed, accurate records not of necessarily her, but of some of the prisoners and the commandants involved. Is that worth pursuing anymore? Yeah, we did do research in, in German records. I mean, that was something I could do <laughs> because I have German. Uh, she does too. But um, uh, but uh, in terms of the, yes, the Germans kept a lot of records. They also destroyed a lot of records, especially the SS. So unfortunately, most of my Donick's records were destroyed. Um, so there was only so much that, that we could find. But I did find, um, as she talks about uh, in, in 1944, uh, when again some uh, peasants, victims of pacification operations were dumped in Majdanek, how she was able to get some of the, the women and children released. And that Majdanek, I found slips of paper, like receipts that she signed or she was taking out prisoners from Majdanek. So there were some things like that. Were you able to locate any of the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of any of these people to verify? The, the Mailbergs didn't have any children. Uh, no, but any of the survivors that she rescued. Oh, no. No, we, we wouldn't know them by name. Right. Uh, the, the, the Polish peasants that we, met, that we kept mentioning, or the, nine, the close to 10,000 Poles, they were just numbers on the reports. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are no name lists. Yeah. And for many of those, they would not have known who she, they wouldn't have necessarily known her role, and they certainly wouldn't have known who she really was. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
even some of the survivors of Majdanek, I mean, all of the survivors of Majdanek, they did not know that she was, that Yanina was Jewish. They knew her as the Countess Suchodolska. Mm -hmm. And if they wrote about her in, or they mentioned her in their, in their accounts, it was as this Polish Countess Suchodolska. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thanks. Do you have a sense of whether within Poland there's interest in her story and, and like stories, or is there a sense of wanting to move on and put this uh, episode or this period behind them? There is immense interest in Janina's story. So when we were doing our research, especially in Lublin, when we met with fellow historians and archivists at the Majdanek Museum, at the, there's a, another kind of Jew institution, government, insti government run institution, which is dedicated to Jewish history and Holocaust history of, of Lublin. They were, the staff there were very much interested in the story. They never even knew that Janina um, Melberg, was, I mean, that Janina Suchodolska was, was Jewish. They want to see this story. We, Probably in a year or so, our book will be translated to, will be published in Poland. We have a Polish publisher as well. There is also interest here in the US coming from the Polish embassy in making sure that we honor Janina Melberg for what she did during the war and that we know about her story. Any other questions? Well, we'll leave it there tonight. Please join me in thanking Elizabeth White and Joanna Sewell. <laughs>